On Children by Khalil Gibran. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies so he loves the bow that is stable. Hello and welcome to the annual State of the School meeting for the Lake Champlain Waldorf School community. Our intention here tonight is to provide an update on the financial, operational, and pedagogical workings of the school over the past year, as well as a brief orientation to how we operate for those who are newer to our community. Tonight, we will hear from our Board of Trustees about who they are, what their role is in our school, and how they're working to secure the future of this organization. Our business administrator will provide a financial overview of the past year and how your valuable tuition and donation dollars are put to work. We'll hear from some of our faculty leaders with updates specific to the early childhood, lower school, and upper school. Our college guidance counselor will acknowledge our seniors and celebrate the next steps on their journeys. We'll hear from the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee about their work to support the development of the school culture that equips us all to recognize and dismantle systems of bias and oppression in our lives. We'll hear from Health and Safety, known also as the Committee That Never Sleeps, about some of the curveballs this year has thrown us and how we are catching them and lobbing them right back. We will close by hearing from our Community Relations team about our annual fund, Festival Life, and Parent Community. You may not know this, but Waldorf is actually the fastest growing independent non-denominational educational movement in the world. There are over a thousand schools and initiatives. There are Waldorf students learning on every continent. If we count a Waldorf homeschooling family on Esperanza base in Antarctica, but I'm gonna count them. It's pretty incredible. It's an exciting time to be part of this educational movement. And as the oldest Waldorf school in our state and one of only 34 Waldorf high schools on this continent, Lake Champlain Waldorf School has such a rich history and community context and such an exciting future as we travel more deeply into ourselves through place-based learning, through our relationship with the Abenaki tribe in whose ancestral homeland we live and work, and through really living into each student's human birthright and responsibility as a cherished and protective member of the natural world around us. At the same time, we're also moving outward into the world through new programs of professional development that allow our teachers to benefit from experts in teaching for justice and inclusion, from brain science that's emerging around effective early literacy instruction, and from Waldorf communities around the world, most excitingly from the Fuyan Waldorf School in Shanghai, which is soon to launch a satellite high school program based here at LCWS, which will enrich the experience of our students and faculty in both countries. We are in year two right now of a three-year study of a new teacher rotation model in which a first grade specialist serves as a living bridge between the early childhood years and the grade school experience. A second through sixth grade cycle cultivates that enduring, nurturing relationship in which so much of elementary learning takes place. And a seventh and eighth grade teaching team provides a valuable new perspective for the young adolescent and applies focused expertise to preparing them for the high school years. The high school years, probably the most significant undertaking of our new College of Teachers has been the revisioning of our high school program for the smaller student body and the specific needs of our students today. 
We are in our first year of this new high school program, which is grounded in the values of service, community, social justice, and stewardship of resources. At the heart of its pedagogy is the belief that learning lies where skills and knowledge meet lived experience. Through the integration of comprehensive and stimulating academics, the values of social entrepreneurship and innovation, through the arts, community engagement, students are developing the tools to become self-directed learners, able to take initiative in the world. We're excited for the opportunity to deepen existing partnerships that serve these students, such as our long relationship with New Village Farm, such as our relationship with the Clemens Family Farm, Maritime Museum, Nelhegan Band of the Abenaki Nation, and also to um, explore new ones with the Community College of Vermont, with the Fuyan Waldorf School and others. I have a milestone to share in our journey to make LCWS as excellent a place to work as it is to attend. I am excited to say that as of the beginning of this school year, we have reached our goal of base pay parity for our faculty that we announced three years ago at this meeting. This represents an overall 11.4% increase in teacher compensation, including faculty um, pay and benefits over the past three years. And it means that our base pay is right at the median and actually above the mean for day schools our size in the Northeastern United States. We have more work to do to appropriately recognize and compensate experience, and that's where we'll be turning our attention next, as well as to the professionalization of our administrative pay structure. We're also investing in teacher preparation this year, more than ever, with an apprenticeship program that's gotten underway and is picking up steam to recognize and cultivate teacher potentials. We're working with partnerships, most significantly with the Stern Center, that allow our teachers to work together and with other educators to deepen their expertise, to expand their pedagogical toolboxes. And we've worked a lot this year on how we set, measure, and meet learning goals for each student. We feel really good about our whole school learning support coordinator who's been connecting teachers and students and families with resources. We're looking forward to, in the future, developing structures for in-house tutoring and emotional modulation or behavioral skill support but that's still outside of our reach tonight. It's a special time to be able to check in as a community. Here, a little more than halfway through the school year, as we've set the tone, we've gotten underway, and there are still the opportunity to um, bring more content. There are still significant events that lie ahead, significant work to be done, and more victories that we'll have a chance to celebrate together before the school year is over. We're going to talk just a little bit about this all tonight. And as you develop questions, I hope that you'll mark them, enter them into the Q&A. We'll be answering questions following the presentation here. And the conversation doesn't end tonight. We'll be able to continue it through class meetings, through individual meetings, and through conversations throughout our community. So welcome tonight. Welcome to the current families who entrust your precious children to our care. Welcome to alumni families who see your children continuing to flourish and grow in ways made possible by their Waldorf education. Welcome to extended family members whose active interest in your grandchildren, nieces, or nephews helps to make this education possible. Welcome to our faculty and staff whose daily care and nightly prayer hold and nurture the whole. Welcome to everyone who's donated to our annual fund, scholarship campaign, faculty care fund, or otherwise contributed to the financial health of our school. Welcome to trustees past and present, and all of those of you who have contributed your time, talent, and treasure to build this magnificent school. It's an honor to be with you here, here metaphorically speaking, here in this digital space. And I'll turn things over now to Christina Bell, President of the Board of Trustees. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. My name is Christina Bell. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the mom of Emmeline, who's in the second grade, and Samuel, who's in the fifth grade, and I'm currently serving as the board president. I want to tell you a little story about why I serve on the board. Um, I remember arriving at the Lake Champlain Water School the very first time 
and we drove up and I immediately felt like I was um, coming into something very special and very unique. And as I toured and saw teachers interacting with students and I saw children playing in the natural environment in our beautiful campus and our woods, I was just so relieved and grateful that it existed because um, it was such a good fit for our family. But and what I realized was I wanted to show my gratitude for the parents who came before, who made that moment possible, where I showed up at the school and thought to myself, I am so glad this exists. I'm so glad that whoever it was that made this place, like, I want to say thank you to them. So I find it meaningful to be on the board because what I do is I try with the other trustees to care for the school, to care for what we've been given, and also to make sure that in the future, 10 or 20 or 30 years from now, some other parent can have that experience. They can drive up to our beautiful campus and think, wow, I'm so glad that this exists. And this is something that is so different and so right for my child. President, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, the other trustees who work so hard um, on behalf of our school, Emily Bayer Pact, Dan Cavanaugh, Danielle Drogalis, Bette Dews, Justine Beats, Jason Frischman, Abigail Deal Noble, and Sherry Carlson. These are our teammates um, in this work. So you probably know that what we do is we we take care of the strategic financial and legal health of the school. And I'll give you a little snapshot into some of the work that we've been doing. This year, we have supported proposals from our teachers, specifically from our College of Teachers, that center the student. That's our highest priority. We've also been supporting and investing in proposals that help to attract, retain, and develop excellent teachers because we know we absolutely know that excellent schools are made of excellent teachers. So we are supporting um, that endeavor as best we can. As well, we are working hard to balance our responsibilities towards our families, towards making this education as accessible as possible, and also our responsibilities to our faculty and staff and making this a wonderful place to work and a sustainable place to work. So we've been working on that currently. What does the future of board work look like? Where is the school going? I know a lot of us um, have spent time asking ourselves those questions. Here's what the future of board work looks like. We must support our teachers and our faculty. When they bring us proposals that, um, that enhance our programs and that increase the rigor and the vigor of our academic excellence, we need to be able to say yes to those programs. Um, the other thing we're going to need to do is we need to have a sustainable fund that supports um, our growing school. We need to be able to have a cushion and a place where we can um, grow our our wealth so that when teachers come to us and they say, this is what we need to meet student needs, this is how we can best um, support the children in this school and the students and their learning needs, we, we, we want to be able to say yes. They're, this is a faculty-led school and they know what they need to do their jobs. And so in order to say yes, we need to, first of all, be completely grateful for the fact that uh, we have received grants and these grants are related to the COVID pandemic. And we know that we won't be receiving those grants forever. You'll see on our budget that uh, a large part of the money that we're spending this year is from COVID related grants. What we need to do is we need to have funds to that degree, to that same extent, but that come from our revenue. And so what does that mean for board work? What it means is that we're gonna ask our head of school and our college of teachers to make recommendations about where we can best increase our revenue, 
um, in ways that are mission aligned. So one of the things that we have, that parents have told us is that meaningful camp and summer programming is important. There are a lot of parents that are working or that want their, their students to be um, with their peers and learning during the summer and experiencing new things. And so we may have to make that a, one of the highest priorities for our administration, head of school and faculty. How can we make the most of our summer, for example? I want to um, leave you with one call to action. This Wednesday, or no, this, this third Wednesday of March, which is March 16th, we will be having a board meeting. It'll be at 545, and of course it will be a Google Meet link, and we'll meet virtually. But I wanna ask you to join us. Uh, we very much need um, more perspectives, more feedback, more um, ideas. This is a growing school and those of you who feel called and feel that you have gifts to share, I know that um, I know that you would find it very satisfying to come and be able to share those gifts. So, if you have gifts in math, <laughs> if you like forecasting and showing us the possibilities of what the future can look like, uh, we would very much value that. If you're a writer and you can um, write to our parents um, and communicate with our parent community, with our faculty, with our staff, yeah, writers, communicators, and uh, math and finance people, please join us. Uh, we'd love to have you. Hi, I'm Gloria Irons, and I am the school's business administrator. I have responsibility in the areas of operational and financial matters. Uh, I'm going to go over some basic financial information as well as briefly review the 21-22 budget, the income and expense categories, um, to give you a basic overview of the school's financial picture. For anyone with, who would like additional information or more detailed information, please feel free to reach out to me or to our controller, Holly Fournier. Um, we both are happy to answer any questions you might have or, again, go over more detail about the school's finances. Um, both of our contact information is listed on the school website, and we're happy to speak to anyone about this. Um, I'd like to start with some basic financial and just some numbers. Um, the, currently, the number of students we have enrolled is 177. The number of full-time faculty is 28. Um, the number of part-time faculty is 10. Our current budget is $3,199,724. Um, we did have a balanced budget, so that was the amount of our income as well as our expenses. Um, the average cost, based on the number of students and our total budget, um, the average cost to educate each student then is close to about $18,000. Um, for point of reference, in the Champlain Valley School District for the K through their K through 12, their average is closer to 22,000 per student. Um, one thing to note about our um, income and expenses, we do have about one third or 59 of our 177 students um, receiving tuition assistance. Um, the total dollar value of that is for the 21-22 school year was a little over $470,000. Um, it's important to note that our tuition assistance isn't funded by an endowment or any outside source, so that is income that we, or tuition that we simply don't collect. Um, however, making an education at LCWS possible for families who could otherwise not afford it is something that we value and prioritize. On the income side, if you look at the pie chart, you'll see that tuition and fees comprise about 68% of the budget. Annual giving campaign, which is our annual fund, this year's goal is $135,000, and we expect to meet it. Uh, that comprises about 4.2% of the budget. Under other fundraising is 1.9%. Those are things like our spring benefit and silent auction, our new Beehive School store, and our supper club. Uh, COVID support is at almost 26% of our budget this year. We have been fortunate to have secured two Paycheck Protection Program loans, both of which have now been forgiven, as well as numerous grants from the state of Vermont to stabilize our early childhood programming and for general support for the entire school. Um, 775,000 of this COVID-related income 
uh, is recognized in the current year's budget. However, over half of that has been set aside in the expense section to use as strategic reserves for future years. Um, in the expense side, we have teacher salary and benefits comprising the bulk of our expenses at 67.1% of the budget. Uh, administrative expenses come in at about 4.9%. These are all expenses not directly connected to teaching and learning. They are infrastructure expenses, um, insurance, fundraising expenses, accounting fees, postage, printing, advertising, things like that. Student activity, that's 5.9% of the budget. Uh, this supports expenses related with school programs outside the basic classroom needs. That's things like after school sports, class trips, camps, transportation, uh, educational support, and many others. Uh, debt service is 4.5% of our budget. That is based on our uh, loan that is held by Northfield Savings Bank. Uh, it's a $2,183,000 loan. That's a mortgage basically comprised of funds that were borrowed um, to build the current early childhood building, expand the lower school building, and purchase the Bostwick uh, farm property that is now our Bostwick campus. Um, we also have buildings and grounds at 4.4% of the budget. Those are things like utilities, mowing, plowing, road maintenance, um, building maintenance and supplies, trash removal. Um, we did also include in this current year's budget a special one-time $40,000 capital expenditure for the lower school building to upgrade our boilers and also to construct a separate gender-inclusive restroom. Uh, as mentioned previously, 13.2% of the budget is the strategic reserves, which are funds that are being held for future years. In summary, LCWS, like most independent schools, relies on more than just tuition for delivering an excellent education. In order to provide a Waldorf education to an economically diverse student body, we must fundraise about 8 to 10 percent of our budget each year. Fundraising this school year will raise over $240,000 uh, through events and efforts by our volunteers, which is really incredible. Um, the Board of Trustees is committed to funding yearly salary increases for our faculty and staff which means our expenses will increase year over year, um, as do everyone's. Um, the Finance Committee reviews our spending on a monthly basis to make sure that the school is living within its means and within its budget. Um, if, as I said previously, if anyone has interest in learning more about our finances or in potentially becoming a member of our Finance Committee, uh, please reach out. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thanks so much. This year in the early childhood program at our school, we've had a really successful year yet again, even though we've continued in having a pandemic. Again, the teachers have really tried to absorb the responsibilities of keeping COVID protocols in place and really try to allow the children to have as much of a typical experience as they would um, at our school in different years. Um, this year we've been able to utilize our outdoor classrooms and our beautiful campus, as well as coming inside to use our beautiful classrooms. Um, the children also have been able to mix and see each other in the different classrooms in a way that we weren't able to last year. So this year they've really um, gotten to know each and every one of them and they know all of the teachers as well. So it's really created a strong and healthy and robust community, especially since we have increased our students. We have many more classes and many more teachers and many more children. Um, over the past several years, the early childhood program um, and the teachers have really started to look at the ways that we meet all of the children in our care since we serve such a broad age range. Um, in particular, we've been looking a lot at how to best serve the kindergarten students as they're moving to first grade and creating a bridge between those two programs with the help of our colleagues in the broader Waldorf movement, we've been looking at um, implicit versus explicit instruction, and in particular in the way that we do DEI work with the children. So um, we've been studying as a whole movement for the past two years 
um, on how, when is it appropriate to be explicit in the things that we are teaching and when is it appropriate to be implicit. And what we're learning is that it's very important to do both and <clears throat> we are bringing more explicit learning to our children um, through DEI work and then also through pre-literacy skills. We're trying to um, foster childhood for children and, and allow them all that wonderful play and good work that they get to do and also prepare them for their next steps as they're looking towards first grade. So we're working with rhyming and um, clapping games and all sorts of wonderful pre-literacy skills that we're trying to work into our curriculum in a really holistic way. Over the last several years, we've seen a huge demand in childcare in Vermont. And we've been really studying what the need is in our community. And we're seeing that there's a need for a broader age range than what we have been previously serving. Um, several years back, the mixed kindergartens began to have three-year-olds in our programs, which typically had had three and a half to six-year-olds. And while that worked incredibly well, we were seeing a bigger need than what we were able to support in just those classes. And so we began to study and look at um, bringing children of younger ages to us. And so we've opened up um, a nursery program, which has served um, two and a half um, to three and a half and four year olds. And that mixed age group is so sweet and they're doing such good work with their teachers. And as we're looking forward to next year, we are looking to um, continue that work, deepen that work, and then look to the future as to how we can continue to serve all of the families that are trying to come our way. As I reflect back on the last couple of years and in this, as I look back at this year, um, I'm incredibly proud of our early childhood program for being able to shift and teach um, exactly the way that we wanna be able to teach these children while being in a pandemic and for this year while having expanded to include so many more teachers and families with us. I, I mean, my metric is, are the, when I walk into the classroom, are the children happy, are they? Right. Yeah. That metric is a really important resource for us as a school, is our teachers' observation and in the moment assessments mm -hmm. of their students' journey toward wholeness, yeah. that are we looking at a whole student and do we understand how to, how to continually nudge toward wholeness? Yeah, yeah I think um, I see the, the children really um, engaging with each other within the classroom purposely, purposefully, but also with each other cross class. Mm. And I think that, that that's the difference that I I see more and more this this year and to some degree last year, but even more this year, that um, that we're breaking down these the kind of the culture of classes being um, loyal to each other and and um, islands. So I think that's what I would say is is the goal for me for the whole that whole school feeling. And the immersions have been an important part of that, right? Yeah. So the immersion, the um, the immersion in the fall, the land acknowledgement immersion, was uh, really exciting for the children. They the first graders got to do. Um, Play with the eighth graders, and, the, and the, they work together, and, and it it definitely came out of the the work that we were doing with Vera Longtoshi, and that 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 was one aspect. And it was kind of like she was the star uh, performer in in bringing this to us. Um, but as far as the kind of the, the meetings that we would have in the amphitheater, and then coming back to, to the classroom in these mixed groups. It, um, it really felt like it was an integrated, exciting time for the school and for the children. And How has it been for the students to all be learning these two new languages at the same sort of pace? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the children were really taken up by the 
the Spanish, um, the first half of the year where we were all working on Spanish. And I think that um, you um, you really heard the the children talking outside of class about their Spanish experience and where some of the activities were parallel from grade to grade, they, they loved that. When they knew that we were about to make the transition to Mandarin, I, I wasn't sure what, what was going to be, like, were they going to be sorry to say goodbye to Spanish? And, and they were just, the first graders were just so excited to, to try something new. And they were, in the weeks up, is, is this the week when we're doing Mandarin? Will we be doing Mandarin this week or next week? And, and they really loved um, tackling something they have no relationship whatsoever to, entirely fresh. Um, and there's nobody in the community um, who they can, who is more expert on this, who they can say, yeah, um, oh yeah, I remember in first grade, they're all, they're all tackling it new. And I think, I think that, um, it's, it's worked even better than my hope uh, as far as tackling us. Some, something new that um, there was no, no framework, there was no, nothing to fall back on. That feeling of newness is one that I definitely experience in this branch this year too. And it does feel like we're doing something very familiar that's squarely in our wheelhouse, but we're also doing it in a new way and with new insights. Um, how has this year been for the faculty in the lower school? So keeping largely the same faculty uh, in the lower school and working together, um, I think that the lower school class teachers in particular have worked well together. Really felt like um, in the, the, the Lead to Read program, where we we're particularly the younger, the, the, the teachers of the youngers, um, we've, it's the first time in my years here where we are all working on something purposely, purposefully together over time. It's exciting to feel like, um, like we're we're all working even cross branch with the with the early childhood in these the, the professional development, but also an idea of the continuum, not just uh, the, the hyper focus that class teachers have had for their particular grade. Mm -hmm. I think that's really exciting. Is that your question? <laughs> It really, it really broadly was, and for anyone who hasn't, who isn't familiar with the Lead to Read program, will you tell us a little bit about this Stern Center partnership and the professional development and the student assessment um, and insight part that we're working with? Yes, it's it's both been exciting to have the instruction and then also a place to bring questions and real time um, uh, experiences where. You're saying, you know, this is not going so well, or I feel like I'm onto something, but I need the next step. That I think that those uh, the meetings with the master teachers from Stern Center have been um, great, but also literally taking classes with other teachers here. It's, that has never happened in my years here, and and we're it it, it is integrating from a professional perspective, integrating our, our work together. Mm -hmm. What do you see on the horizon for the lower school branch? What are the seeds that are being um, cared for below the surface right now? So the two big things that I'm interested in is, is working on met the math curriculum and, and professional development in a same, in a parallel way to the, the way that we've been working with literacy. Um, I think also the development of, of our outdoor education program is really important. It's important to me, but I think it's also something that, that has been lying in the wings 
waiting for it to be ex fully explored and um, making real use of our amazing uh, resources here on this campus, but also outside this campus. And <clears throat> I think our partnership with New Village Farm has been really exciting. It's, it's a long-standing, but it's also, we're beginning to know more about what we want from, um, from the experience and then making sure that experience continues and that it's not just a discrete lesson once a week at, at the farm. In this developmental stage in the Waldorf Park, what is it that we're really working to bring to the students and how does that look here this year? Broad strokes. Accountability for self, responsibility to the other, responsibility to the world through meaningful work. Um, we have morning meetings together, so the community aspect of sharing festivals, sharing our breaks, um, sharing meals occasionally is very strong and contributes to that really warm and friendly um, camaraderie in the middle, middle school and high school. Hi. Yeah, cyber civics remains a really important part of our curriculum, letting students um, develop the skills to be smart and wise and um, proactive, um, to not look at this technology around them and come from a place of fear, but really think of it as a creative outlet and Use, use the tool as a creative outlet and not just be passive consumers. <clears throat> Unbound has been a place where we are focusing on anti-bias tools um, as a skill set that the kids can take forward, but also as a class where um, we can talk about um, black history, we can talk about women's rights and um, bring in some of the festival work so that it's not tokenism. Um, we've been doing sex ed in that class too. Um, finding art projects to take the work that we are doing and then um, be able to synthesize it through a creative expression. Um, the students love crafts. <laughs> this year the seventh graders um, have made their copper with Miss Galper. Um, and at any time I think about what meaningful work looks like in the Waldorf school, I think about those kids pounding the copper outside this classroom. Um, and then they come up with these beautiful creations. So that the high schoolers right now have just sewed waterproof mitten covers in hopes uh, to take those as part of their gear on a winter camping trip. They're making their own snowshoes right now in outdoor ed. So Mr. Palmer has um, built a steam box and they're, they're making their own snowshoes. Um, outdoor education has always been very important. Since the pandemic, we've brought a lot more outdoor education in-house and have really looked at the scope of that curriculum um, and starting to start to build in some expectations for different grades. So the skills that they're building in outdoor education are skills that they will eventually use in middle and, and high school for these magnificent trips that we go on. Um, so for instance, fire building, um, not tying off. Both of those are really great skills for when we get out into the woods and they're putting up tarps and they're responsible for, for building the fire that we're gonna cook on for the week. The upper school to me represents possibility for growth and thriving. I see, I see the students taking leadership for their community Kids love being here, they love school, and they appreciate and love their teachers. Like, what more could you ask for? <laughs> Hi, I'm Alice.
Alice Lee Sarag, and I'm in my 11th year as the college counselor here at the Lake Champlain Waldorf High School. While I also work as an independent college consultant with public school students, my time with Lake Champlain Waldorf students is particularly rewarding because of the deep insight and appreciation for their high school experience that they are able to articulate for me and include in their college applications. My high school colleagues are also a great resource in helping me to understand each student, their strengths and struggles, what they bring to their classmates, as well as to the entire high school community. Each fall, I write a counselor's letter of recommendation to be submitted with each senior's college application. In my letter, I quote high school faculty's words to help give college admissions staff an in-depth picture of the student. Adjectives to describe this year's seniors, Bevan, McKenzie, and Wren, include warm, curious, nurturing, protective, engaged, studious, inquisitive, intellectual, and motivated. Wren and McKenzie are still waiting to hear back from their colleges, but Bevan applied early decision to Skidmore, where she was accepted and will attend, adjoining Lake Cham former Lake Champlain Waldorf High School students Anna Churchill, Stella Rose Johnson, and Lucy Webster. It's been a great pleasure to support these students. As a former French teacher and a parent at the high school, I appreciate how much these seniors have grown just in the last year and how ready they are for their next chapter. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so let me introduce myself. My name is Jason Frischman. First and foremost, I am a parent here at the Lake Champlain Waldorf School. My older son, Micah, is in eighth grade, and my younger son, Isaiah, is in fifth grade. And yeah, they've both been through since uh, they were wee little ones. Um, I'm also currently on the board. So if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us at the board. And currently I'm talking to you tonight about the uh, diversity, equity and inclusion committee of which I sit on. Um, we are a committee that have been active throughout most of the pandemic. And the school has actually done some DEI work before that, but formally we came together about two and a half years ago. And I just wanted to share a little bit of what we've been doing in the last couple of years. So what I would love to say is, is that due to sort of where we all are, um, state of the world and the pandemic, state of the school, all of these things, um, we've been doing our very best to, to lay the foundation for the very important DI work that we need to continue doing here at the school. So the very first thing that we've been doing is as a group, we've been meeting and training and learning and trying to educate ourselves so that we can continue to support growth and development at the school. Um, we have an open invitation to any parents who want to get involved. You can get in touch with us um, through over email at dei at lakechamplainwaldorfschool.org. Um, most importantly, we hold monthly community conversations where we talk about both timely and broader issues. Uh, last summer, we did a book group, which was really lovely. And we're really trying to um, begin by educating ourselves. The second thing that we're doing is um, we're supporting the teachers in the college in their unbound curriculum, where the college as a whole has been really taking a deep look at the curriculum for every grade level, all of our festivals, and um, many of the practices so that we can be both welcoming and aware to a, just as diverse a group as possible. And letting people know, uh, letting our students know that this is something that we as a school community prioritize and value. And, you know, lastly, one of the other things that we do is something, uh, the school, as, as a school, we hold the uh, Diversity and Inclusion Fund, which is basically a scholarship fund to expand and enrich our community and our by recognizing and supporting outstanding students from various cultural, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, these students often have diverse talents, interests, and life experiences, and uh, we're really hoping to broaden and deepen that offering as well. So the DEI committee um, is open for people who are interested in engaging with us. Um, another function that we've 
really been doing over the last couple of years is being a communication hub. So if people have questions, we're not always going to be the ones to answer them, but we will get to you and we will let people know who will answer them or how we can get you answers. So um, if you have questions, if you want to reach out, if you want to get involved, again, DEI at Lake Champlain Waldorf School. And once again, my name is Jason Frischman. You can feel free to reach out to me directly or anyone on the committee. And uh, yeah, I hope you're having a great evening. And uh, I look forward to seeing you either around the school on virtual world or in the parking lot. Have a great evening and thank you. Good night. As we prepare to enter what will be the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Health and Safety Committee is above all else grateful. We're grateful to all of you for the ways in which you've taken up our health and safety protocols. We're grateful to our teachers who have taught with depth and skill and passion despite masking and outdoor classrooms and so much more. We're grateful to our students who have shined with resilience as they've had to navigate a new world. And we're grateful to our administration who have gone above and beyond in every way to keep this community safe. The response this school and this community has shown to COVID-19 is nothing short of remarkable. Since we all came back together again in the fall of 2020, our school has had to close for three days because of what we thought was a COVID positive case in one of our buildings. Then in January of 2022, the EC closed for two days because we could not staff it properly due to teacher illness. Then again in January of 2022, grades one through five closed for two days because of multiple cases throughout those grades. Outside of those days, we have been in school learning together in person since the fall of 2020. That is an incredible feat during this pandemic. And it is because of the diligence and care of our community that this has been possible. Now, this is not to say COVID has not affected our small community in significant ways. Between Christmas break and February 1st, we had six lead teachers out with COVID. Students have had to miss school due to minor illness or quarantine protocols, and families have had to shift work schedules and more to accommodate our health and safety guidance. We are grateful for all of it, and we recognize the real loss and hardship that this has put on many. We are thrilled to say that we know of no in-school transmission of COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic, despite having cases throughout multiple grades in January. We are also thrilled that following the February break, we have been able to ease our guidelines so that our students can see each other's full faces more frequently and our parents can be welcomed back into our classroom. This pandemic has taught us so much about resilience and strength and loss and flexibility. It is our sincere hope that as we move forward and look towards next year, that we will be in a place where COVID protocols are minimal. We would be naive to say at this time that we know what next year will look like, but we are more than cautiously optimistic that next year will bring more full faces into the classroom and less COVID protocols. Thank you all for all that you have done to make it possible for us to be together learning for so many wonderful days of school. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Francis Cuddy and I am closing the presentation portion of our um, State of the School tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in and I just would like to remind you to feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A box as you have them and we will get to those right after I share some really exciting news with you. At this point in the school year, we've just completed our annual fund goal of $135,000 and um, we're just blown away by the generosity from our community this year. It's um, come through gifts to the fund and cleaning support when our staff and faculty needed it most. So many delicious treats in the faculty lounge and just such generous gifts over the holidays. So thank you all so much for all you have done to make this challenging year so rewarding and to feel like we're all in community together. As every private school, our annual budget depends upon fundraising income as well as tuition income. 
And when we receive 100% participation from our full faculty and staff and our board of trustees, and especially our parent community, it is such an incredible vote of confidence from all of our stakeholders. So this year on our day of giving, which is March 15th, we'll be inviting you to make a donation in support of our incredible faculty and staff. And every donation we receive on this day will be for our faculty and staff care fund. We're thrilled to be able to do this, having completed our annual fund goal already. And um, you'll hear more about this soon. As we have welcomed our students back this from this um, February break. It's been so lovely to see so many faces and um, there's so much more to come this spring with our May Day celebration, which will be Sunday, May 1st, Grandparents and Special Friends Day on May 20th, and our spring benefit on May 21st. After a two-year hiatus, Steve Olson is preparing our orchestras and we are in discussions with venues and caterers and dancing and, an, and bringing an auction together. If you'd like to be a part of pulling this fun event together, please reach out and contact me. And I just would like to close by saying, I know that it might seem like people are asking for participation or donations quite a lot from you. And I personally have felt as a student here and as a parent here that the more that um, my family contributes to the school, the more my students and me as a student when I was younger have felt in community and at home here at school, which has such an, a tremendous impact on the learning potential for every student here and also for the support of our community as we parent and move through life together. So I will turn it over to your questions now and thank you so much for tuning in to our State of the School.